All right, we're probably good to get started here. If you can find a, a seat. If we're running out of chairs, we can pull in some extra ones. There's some folding chairs in the corner. All right, so what, what we want to do, we talked about this. This is, this is our introductory um, session about the Enneagram. And like both Wesley and I have said, we're not experts. We're not certified somehow in this. Uh, we're familiar with it. And, um, and so are many of you. So we want to facilitate a discussion if you're not familiar with it, today is a general introduction to try and situate ourselves with respect to what this is all about and how we engage in it. Uh, we're going to use some slides. I know the people who are on Zoom, um, we can send you the, the, those slides later. Mm -hmm. I know you will only kind of vaguely see maybe those images as you're watching on Zoom, but we can supply you that with those as well as... Um, as well as for everyone else, um, that can that can be supplied later. So what we wanted to start with, yeah, uh, something about the title. What? <laughs> for, for dummies from dummies, <laughs> just so we can center ourselves. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Oh, I didn't even notice the yeah. subtitle. Yeah. For, for dummies from dummies. That's yeah. Uh -huh. That's perfect. Uh -huh. That's exactly what this is. Um, so, what I'm going to I'm going to start, and then Wesley's going to take over with the majority of the introduction because actually he's doing some classes in this right now in his graduate work. Um, but I thought it was useful for many of us to kind of set this in a biblical context because I came up in a background where everything needed to be set in a bil biblical context, and that is a good, you know, kind of a good posture to take. Um, and I know in churches I would have grown up in, we would have been, you know. But this isn't in the Bible. You know, that would have been our reaction. But this isn't in the Bible, so why are we even engaging this? Mm -hmm. So here's, here's a, just a brief kind of how I would set this in a biblical context. So the Enneagram is all about self-awareness. It's a tool, and Wesley's going to have more to say about this. It's a tool for understanding ourselves. And while we might say, well, Jesus didn't really talk a lot about specifically our need to understand ourselves. At the same time, virtually everything he was saying was about understanding ourselves. And so when I thought about a passage that I would use to kind of illustrate this, I always go to the Sermon on the Mount, kind of the core of the Gospels. The Gospels are the core of the New Testament, and the Sermon on the Mount is kind of like the core of the Gospels. And so I started reading through the Sermon on the Mount, and I thought, well, there's a lot of passages in here that have to do with Jesus basically encouraging us to understand ourselves, to think about, well, what is it exactly that you worry about? What you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, you know? He's, he's getting us to think about, how is it that I approach life? And then he'll say things, but you can't serve both God and mammon, right? So Think about what is the process going on? Am I aware of the things that consume my thought processes? How much anxiety I have? But the passage I chose was from uh, Matthew 7, very familiar, the first few verses about do not judge. And Jesus says, do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but not notice the log that is in your own eye? Well, we might read that and think, well, the log has to do with sin. No, not necessarily. The log is not necessarily sin. The log could be something like a certain tendency I have, which could either be used for good or could be used detrimentally. Right? So the log here... To find out the log that's in my eye is a process of self coming to self-awareness. What Jesus is saying is don't, don't be analyzing someone else. You think about what is it that's tripping you up. And again, it doesn't, the log does not equate with a sinful activity or something. For example, and, and, uh, 
and my examples are purely theoretical. If you see yourself in it, it is not intentional on my part. <laughs> so I, no, I'm not picking on anyone. So let's just say that someone is a very outgoing person. So someone's a very outgoing person. Okay, so being an outgoing person can be used, can be a very good thing. It can be, it can be used for, you know, helping others, uh, you know, paying attention, going to them, talking to them, making them feel comfortable, you know, helping them feel like they're a part of things. They, an outgoing person can reach out very easily. Mm -hmm. But then an outgoing person could also sometimes, you know, monopolize a conversation because there's a bunch of people like me that are tend to be reserved and the outgoing person tends to run the conversation. See, I think you could read what Jesus is saying about the log that's in your own eye. That's about coming to some degree of self-awareness. What is it that maybe I don't realize, but it's not inherently wrong with me, but it's something that could be tripping me up in certain ways. A good a good aspect of my created nature, though, is, is being used by me in a way that's not helpful, right? That's maybe discovering the log that's in my eye and therefore um, thinking about it. There is one, and then I'm going to turn it over to Wesley. There's one proverb that I think really works for the Enneagram. Um, here's, it's 20 verse 5. A plan in the heart of a man is like deep water, but a man of understanding draws it out. Okay, if the, if the man in the first part is the same as the man in the second part, then it's saying the plan that's in, in a person's heart is kind of running deep, but an understanding person learns to draw that out of themselves, right? In other words, come to an understanding. Max? I may be the only person who doesn't know, but what is an enneagram? Okay, that's and that's where we're great segue. Uh -huh. <laughs> Max Max was was told to ask that question right at this point. Uh -huh. So I've given a little biblical rationale. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Wesley's gonna give us an introduction. All what right. Well, great question, Max. Okay. So first of all, let me get into this with a good transition. I don't quote John Calvin often, <laughs> but this is a great quote. Without knowledge of self, there is no knowledge of God. Uh, not just a biblical rationale, but a theological rationale for the Enneagram. This is something to think about as we get into this. And uh, there's, there are a couple books that we're going to be, I'm going to be referring to this book a lot throughout our conversations over the next couple of weeks. This a little bit, I read this one too, but just some books you can consider. My professor recommended this book. I don't have this book, but Beatrice Chestnut is like the guru. So, right, uh, you told me that. So check uh, Beatrice out. Also, Richard Rohr is the one that kind of brought it into the mainstream. I'm gonna get into that too. So any of these resources you can consider if you're, as you're trying to understand what it is. Yes. Beatrice, she's got a, a YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, a YouTube channel. Does she have a podcast too? Yeah, so does uh, Ian Cron, Cron and Susan. Do they have a podcast? I don't know about Alice Frylin. I don't know, but great resources online. So consider that, take a photo. We're gonna send this to you as well. So the Enneagram in one sentence, and I want to challenge you as you're reading some of this, if you're familiar with the Enneagram, maybe you can capture it in one sentence as well. So the first one from Alice Freiling is, the Enneagram is an ancient tool that can help us puzzle, puzzle out who we are. Or the, another one from her same book is, the Enneagram is a mirror for the soul. Or by Alice Freiling again, the Enneagram is one tool to help us along our spiritual journey of awareness. And then this is what the the road back to you, the book, they, they call it the elevator speech. So you need to elevator with someone, need to quickly give a synopsis of what the Enneagram is. You can say the Enneagram is an ancient personality typing system. It helps people understand who they are and what makes them tick. Who which makes is them tick? life, people, what? Yeah, it could be who or what makes them tick, right? So yeah, I think to Max's point is some people I've heard say, the, the whole en Enneagram, and you'll see the symbol that was there on the first uh -huh. thing, and it's got nine types. Some would say that whole thing can be thought of as the face of God. In other words, the particular type that any one of us happen to be is, is the way that we are participating in the fullness of God, mm -hmm. right? Which is, which is a very redemptive thing about saying this, 
if I can learn to understand what makes me tick, mm. yeah, Max is right. Who makes me tick? How was I mm. formed? Mm. This is coming to understand what did God do in making me like me and who I am right now and how can that be best utilized versus trip me up. Uh-huh. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, it's an embodiment yeah. of a particular perspective. Yes, yes. Ancient? Oh, yeah. It doesn't go back to 10,000 B.C. Um, ancient, I think, as is old as the early church fathers were using it as a spiritual direction tool as they're trying to uh, serve the, the members of their, their fellowship and their communities. So it goes back to, uh, I don't know, the, I don't, I don't know a, a number, but give me a number, Greg. Early church fathers. I, I don't know, but, but I, I do know. Yes. Uh-huh. No, it's it. So we're talking 1800 years. I mean, it's yeah. back into the first and second century and the desert fathers and mothers. And we've got their writings like in the filial Kalia. Um, they talk about this. I mean, they talk about a number. Mm -hmm. Right. And understanding yourself. And sometimes we had this, this kind of prejudiced view towards the past, like only recently since Sigmund Freud have we understood the human psyche. Uh -huh. No, no, no. These people had deep understanding uh -huh. of the human psyche, what makes us tick. It's just just like, this is the, but another example would be just like all the Greek myths of Scythius pushing the rock up the hill and it keeps rolling down. That's a story about the human condition. It's saying we're all Scythius pushing the rock up the hill, but every day you get up to push that rock again. Right? The Greeks were trying to probe what is the human condition? What is the nature of our psychology? Right? So, yeah, ancient means we don't even know who came up with it. Yeah. Right? It's really, really old. Uh huh. Yeah. And it, further, ancient is subjective. <laughs> ancient is 100 years for people like me, right? <laughs> right? Right? Exactly. Right? Uh, any any uh, people that are familiar with the Enneagram, any one sentence summaries that you could share or would like to share? Yeah, how would you summarize it? How would you summarize it in one sentence, if you would like to? Life-changing for me. Life-changing, okay. Prepare to be your, uh, what you want. Mm, okay. It's interesting. Since you were talking about it, I was trying to think of action steps to learn from yourself. Is to have yes. to That's right. Yeah. So the interaction becomes a lot more understandable. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll put some cab we'll put a caveat to the caveat, right? Uh -huh. Because, because I, I, and we'll get to that. Yeah, we want to be careful, but it's not. It's not a labeling and diagnosing system. So, yeah. so there's this <laughs> delicate balance between learning how I can effectively interact with others without going around labeling everyone else yeah. and diagnosing them, and spending more time about what's in their eye than, than what's going on in mine. That's right. Right. Because I'm convinced that I interact with other people poorly when I'm not in a healthy place. Mm -hmm. It has less to do with their personality and has more to do with mine. Mm -hmm. If I can be in a healthy place with who I tend to be, then I can more effectively interact with every other personality type. Right? Yeah. Okay. Marsha, Carolyn. That's right. Yeah, it's yeah. not about evaluating. It's not like, oh, I wish I was another number. Every number is part of the face of God, uh -huh. right? You know, it's not about some numbers. If you tend to think, well, that number is better than that number, you're not thinking about it well, uh -huh. right? Because everyone is embodying the image of God in a particular way. So that's another important emphasis. So Daryl's exactly right. It can be very helpful. But we come at it from a very humble place of saying, I know the problem is generally mine. Right? And I need to learn how to interact with others who might be very different in the way they, but we haven't even gotten to what it's yeah. coming from. Well, so yeah. go ahead. Carolyn's got it. Yeah, I think um, expanding a little bit on what I said about <coughs> you know, the who you are and what you need to work on, I've taken it from you know, different results. <laughs> Yeah. 
say that because it does the, the whole number that you arrive at gives me some insight, you know, about uh -huh. where you are currently, but it's not about leaving us in that in that place. Right. Um, but it's, it really offers direction. Yeah. Where am I and how did I get here? Maybe those are... Yeah, yeah, how do I move forward? Yeah. There it is. Yep. Right. So it's a, it's a freeing tool. It's not meant to enslave you. It's a freeing tool. Yep. All right. Well, we got a lot to share, so I'm going to move <laughs> on. Okay. So in the, that book, The Road Back to You, they call it a curious theory of unknown origins, one of their chapters where they're trying to introduce what the Enneagram is. And this is what they – no, no, this is a different – okay. So I took the title from one book and a quote from another book. <laughs> so my brain's everywhere. Okay. I, but I like I like the title of the chapter because it's 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 curious and it's unknown and it's a theory, right? It's, it's saying all the things that we need to say about the Enneagram, right? But the quote by Alice Fr Freiland is important because it's pretty funny, I think. The Enneagram was considered secret knowledge. Lay people, it was thought, could not handle this information with wisdom and care. <laughs> when Richard Rohr, a, Franci a Franciscan teacher of the Enneagram, learned the Enneagram from his spiritual director in the 1970s, he was told not to pass it on and writing, or let's let anyone else where he got it. And what does he do? He writes a book. Yeah. <laughs> I like him. Yeah, yeah right? No reverse psychology going on. Right? So, like I said, there's a lot, there's a lot here. So it was a tool used to, to serve, to offer spiritual direction, and now it's, just, it's revealed to the masses, which can be a scary thing, because we are losing some of this wisdom and care. It's, there are ways to use this in an unhealthy way, and we're going to get to that. Um, and I, I think this quote is important to kind of show us where, where it came from. All right, some things you got to know. Uh, it is a theory that has not been clinically proven. That's going to be important for some of you guys. It's a theory, right? Just like a lot of things in this life. <laughs> it's a theory, but uh, this theory can be very helpful. Uh, the, and, and can we add, uh, Myers-Briggs, a lot yeah. of you are familiar with that? Uh-huh. That's a theory that hasn't been clinically proven either. Yeah. Right? So a lot of the, because how would you set up a controlled experiment about people's personalities to prove that this actually works? I would imagine it's almost impossible yeah. to verify. Uh -huh. um, so, so we shouldn't be like, oh, well, that means this is just made up, you know, nonsense. Uh -huh. No, it kind of has been proven over the centuries to be a helpful tool, right? So. A lot of the things we're very familiar with in this kind of personality typing, they're not clinically proven, right? They are theories. Uh-huh. Yeah. They're not clinically proven at all. Right. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the emphasis is on inner motivations and not simply behavior. Behavior plays a part, but I think inner motivations are primary. And these things usually don't change. What, what drives me inner is like it goes down deep to my, my childhood, right? So these things are, are deep. And numbers are rooted in our childhood experiences, revealing how our coping patterns have stuck with us. So we, as children, we have positive and not so positive experience. The spectrum is wide in this room alone, from trauma to um, better, better childhood upbringing, right? So we all have ways to cope with what we dealt with as children, right? For example, um, I, in a, I identify as a nine, so for whatever reason, I think this has a lot to do with my military growing up as, as a military child. And not just that, growing up in spaces where we, I don't know, we just felt uncomfortable. So I've been, I've been motivated by keeping peace. I want to keep peace, right, at all, all costs. Even if it means you're saying something that I do not think is right, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to stay quiet for the sake of peace because I want to keep peace. I, I was, I was kind of raised thinking that keeping peace was the way to, to exist in this reality, right? So that's just an example. I think you're gonna be able to see yourself as you're, as you're reading more examples and seeing more, more ways that maybe these inner motivations could be realized in your life. And lastly, it, it attempts to make sense of our fears and our desires. So going back to my, my identify, identification with Enneagram 9, I fear conflict. <laughs> because I, I've been taught that conflict is bad. 
right? So as, as I'm trying to be more aware and lean into that, I'm leaning into some conflict now. <laughs> and, and not just for the sake of conflict, but recognizing that this is healthy, right? There's a healthy way to engage in conflict. And so me being aware of that fear is helping me to, I think, be a, a healthier peacemaker. Um, I went back. Okay, this is the chart. This is what the chart looks like, the Enneagram chart. We're not going to get into all of this today, but I just want to expose it to you so you have an image in your head. Like, there's nine different points, but uh, this quote is, is important because I think we... I don't know if I read what you said, Greg. You might be pioneering something, okay? Oh. <laughs> right? But, but let, me, let me read this first, and I'll, I'll share. The Enneagram suggests that there are nine vintage points from which... Oh. This is wrong. From which humans view reality. These points are identified by numbers and are called spaces or types. So Greg would say there are 54 vantage points. Right. Right? Yeah. Because yeah. you have a number, right? But as you learn more about the Enneagram, it's, you're not just your number. There's wings attached to this, and then there's, there's numbers attached to this number. So, I mean, th there's so many parts to this to where there could be up, up to maybe even 54 variations of a single... Yeah, of a the, number. the reason we can talk about 54, and, and I like that. So DISC, if you're familiar with DISC, D-I-S-C, it says there are four types of people in the world. Mm -hmm. Just intuitively, I'm thinking, you know, that might be somewhat helpful, but there's a lot more variety uh -huh. going on than, yeah. than, than you're one of four types. Yeah. Now, so that's useful in certain circumstances, but it's pretty reductionistic, right? Myers-Briggs gives you 16. I'm an INTJ, right? Um, but still 16. What I, what I like about the Enneagram is it was the fullest. Now, obviously, you need to do some reduction because then you could say everyone's unique, in which case then we can't do any sort yeah. of understanding, right? But So there are nine types, but each number you have a wing, which means the, you also kind of have a minor aspect of, e of one of the numbers next to you. So a nine is either going to have an eight wing or a one wing. So now we're up to 18 types. Right, because there's nines who have an eight wing and nines who have a nine, and that's for all of them. But then there are the subcategories. There are three aspects, basically, and we'll get into these, for each of those 18. And that's where you end up at 54. Now, there's not 54 distinct, totally different groups. There's nine basic ones, each with a little variation, and then there's a, a variation of another three below each one. I like that. Mm -hmm. Just intuitively i like that because we're not cookie cutter we know that experientially right none of us are like i'm just like you know one in nine other people i encounter uh -huh. no but when you get to 54 it's like okay now this is a little more believable there's enough subtlety here i'm generally like a lot of people who are similar to me but then we have subtle differences so so yeah so there is as we get further into it those sub categories will add another three to the 18. That's right. <laughs> So and to add to that, I, I sent out in the email a link to the Enneagram Institute. I like to get their daily emails yeah. about my number. It's, it's often the, disappointing. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. it's like, it's like, don't get too much into your head. Uh -huh. Try and really be present. Mm. Yeah. I'm like, okay, okay. It's a reminder <laughs> uh -huh. where I can go yep. if I'm not careful is get all theoretical and not be present, mm. right? Because I'm a five, right? So... I get that, but one of the things, and I don't think this may be unique to, to that institute, but they identify nine levels of functioning for each. So it says, it can, for me as a five, it gives nine levels. One where I'm functioning well, nine is where I have become a recluse. Mm -hmm. I am an eccentric person who's babbling on about things that 
are not tied to reality. That's what I could be, <laughs> right? Because I'm this uh, intellectually uh -huh. oriented, in my head person. Uh -huh. If I get to the most unhealthy place, uh -huh. I'm this strange guy who never interacts with others and is, you know, creating grand theories. And at the best level, I can be insightful and helpful to others, and and you know, and not be a recluse, right? Mm -hmm. And so they even give nine levels. So you could say fifty-four times another nine. Now we're at five hundred types. <laughs> Depending on how, yeah, where I am in that, not only the spectrum of variety within that, but even where I am, and and there's where the directional thing is. How can I be a better version of me? I don't need to be, I don't need to be Wesley, uh -huh. and I don't need to be a peacemaker nine like that, mm -hmm. but I need to be the five I am, which is more the intuitive thinker, but be the best version, uh -huh. not be an unhealthy intuitive thinker, but a healthy one, mm -hmm. right? Well, so. <laughs> well, we're going to keep making. Yeah. We're, we're giving a broad overview. Uh -huh. We're just saying there's a lot of depth here. This yeah. is not simple. Like we, yes, you take a test, you find out one of the three numbers you are, and that's it. You know, no, it's a lot more complex. It should be good to have that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And hey, let me say this. I, an example I shared with Greg earlier. I had a, I was on a Zoom call with a, a, I guess a pastor at some point. And he was, we had a conversation. He asked my Enneagram number, and I said I was a nine. He's like, that's great for pastors. That's a problem. <laughs> uh, because all of these in numbers, any, any number could be a, a pastor or a minister. Greg is five. He's a great pastor. So we, we're not trying to use this as a tool to say, oh, doctors need to be nines, or doctors need to, you know what I mean? So th they do. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, no, but yes, Wesley's got a good point. This is not career typing. Uh -huh. This is personality typing. Yeah. Right? And there's a big difference. Just like Wesley's already made the point, this is not behavior based, it's motivation mm -hmm. based. Should we move on to. Yes, let me share this last point and then we'll yeah. get into that. Okay. So this is my, my results to my tests. As you can see, I showed up in every number. You just this is just the last little thing we'll show. I know it's just layer layer, but mine is my highest is nine, which should show you that we are we represent a little piece of all of these numbers, right? But there's something that just stands out more, right? I'm I'm more driven by the nine slant, if that makes sense. So as you take a test, maybe your your results will look something like this, right? Yeah, this is not an all or nothing. Yeah. So if you if you're familiar with Myers Briggs, Myers Briggs starts with are you introvert or extrovert? It's a complete either or. But introvert, extrovert is behavior. This is not on the level of what's your behavior, how do you interact? No, this is based on what's motivating you. And so you might say with those numbers, an introvert could be any of those numbers and an extrovert could be any of those numbers. It really doesn't matter. We're talking about the way, the kind of the strategy that you employ based on experiences, how you've grown up, it turned out to be a strategy that worked for you and you're probably, and it's not a bad thing, you're going to do that the rest of your life. That's not a bad thing, mm -hmm. right? That's not a negative thing. You don't need to change and be a different personality type. What you need to, what we all need to do is learn how to be self-aware about what that means, how to make the best of who I am as God intends, mm -hmm. right? So, so yeah, it's not career-based, it's not behavior-based. So I thought of an example, so are we gonna just move on with the things it isn't, or? We can, or, or we can go back. Okay, I'm just kinda. Well, do you have some more on what it nope, is? Nope, that's, that's all I have. Okay, so I'm gonna mention, so the way we divide this up, I'm gonna mention some things that I think the Enneagram is not, okay? So Wesley's tried to show, these are some of the things that it really is, what it, what it is supposed to be, used as this tool for self-awareness. But what it's not, okay, so it's not behavior-based. And, and an example, I thought of this, I know you may not know all the, the numbers yet, but it, let's say you saw someone at the side of the road helping someone else change a tire. And if you're using this to diagnose and categorize people, you might go, they're probably a two, the helper. But you know what they could be? They could also be the one, because a one does what is right and the one was driving along and said that person needs help and the right thing to do is help them so a one is helping them change the tire because it's the right thing and a two is helping them change the tire because they just like to help people uh -huh. 
right? And, and the five, like myself, might be stopping to help change a tire because we tend to work out these grand views of how everything structures together. And in my grand view of how everything is, you know, in this general theory of relativity, Einstein sort of way, I think stopping and helping people change tires is part of the grand scheme of how things ought to be, right? And then I was, I was telling this to, to Wesley, and, say, and a nine could stop and change a tire because they like people to be at peace, and they see this person uh -huh. with a flat tire, and they say, that person's probably not at peace. I'm going to stop and help them change the tire, uh -huh. right? See, this isn't like, I see what you're doing. I know what you are. No. We could all be doing the exact same thing, but for very different motivations. That's, right. That's why th we don't want to go around diagnosing, and only you can determine what you are. And even these tests that you can do online, I sent you out a free one. They give you that diagram that Wesley showed you. Now you can pay the, you can click the pay link to get the full report, but <laughs> you don't have to. But, I would even say those online tests are not as accurate, and maybe it's why Carolyn said, I took it twice and it came out different. Uh -huh. They're not foolproof. Like I said in the email, because you, number one, you can answer according to who you think you ought to be mm -hmm. rather than actually who you are. And Wesley had the suggestion of taking it with like your spouse or someone who knows yeah. you well, helping you say, no, no, that's not you, you know, uh -huh. because you're yeah. thinking you're an idealized, well, I'm the person, no, yep. answer truthfully, right? <laughs> so you can get a score that reflects the personality, like how you might think you ought to be, but that might not be who you actually are. So better than the online test is the idea of reading, and that's why I gave you the link to the Enneagram Institute. They have some pretty good descriptions. Read the description and see, you can take the test to get an idea, then go read the description of that one and see if that really sounds like you and you're the only one who knows whether it does, right? They, they also said to take it when you check when you're arrested and not when you're tired. <laughs> uh -huh. Probably another good idea, That's right? Idea. Yeah. A question about this. Yep. If you ask my wife, she would say I'm a five. <laughs> <laughs> yep. He's a terrible test taker. <laughs> 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 Is that part of the yeah. it, it doesn't. My, my thinking is it doesn't give room for growth. It doesn't give. It doesn't let. What I'm wondering is, is there a way, some mechanism, so that maybe your personality as you get older changes? Okay. I, Okay, you My first there. thought is self-awareness. There, I think self-awareness grows, and you're able to grow. Oh, and maybe understand that maybe I'm motivated by something I thought I was, but I'm not. And I think that kind of grows through time. Yeah, yeah, because it is asking. I have to know myself well enough to know what motivates me. Yeah. And you probably could have asked me as a twenty-year-old what I thought motivated me, and I probably would have been wrong, mm -hmm. right? I didn't know myself even well enough to answer such questions well and to, to see how things really work within me. But, but here's part, and, and part of your question pertains to this. Okay, it's, and Marcia brought this up, it, there are no better or worse numbers. So I don't, need to, I don't need to grow to be something other than who I am. I, but there's lots of room for growth because I can become an ever more self-aware and a better version of exactly who I am. So there's tons of room for growth. One of the things I wrote down, what this is not, it's not static and it's, um, it's not predictive. It's not predicting my behavior. One of the great things about self-awareness is when I become aware of things, it gives me more options. Mm -hmm. When I'm ignorant of them, I tend to repeat them without any awareness that I could make other choices. That's right. Right? So being a five does not say I'm locked into certain behaviors, because again, this isn't about behaviors. Being a five, what I tend to be, is it, it, 
kind of tends to channel me in certain directions. When I become aware of that, then I'm actually able to make other choices. When I see that propping up in myself, I can realize, oh yeah, I have a tendency to do that. But right now, I can choose to do something different rather than falling into a pattern unthoughtfully. So a lot of my, my daily emails from this Enneagram Institute are reminding me of such things. It says, you know, it says, today, don't get all in your head. It's like, I don't have to. But it could be my default position, especially if I get anxious and stuff, I go, I'll get all in my head theoretical. It's saying don't. It's saying stay present, connect with others. It's saying you have the possibility. This is not like fatalistic. I am tied into a certain behavior. Because it's not behavior-based and it's not predictive. Does that make sense? So there's lots of room for growth. It's multidimensional. And every number has something wonderful to offer. So whatever we turn out to be, when we find that about ourselves, it's something to grow into and to be aware of the strengths and weaknesses to me that go with it. Now, Derek, you had... A lot. Right. Yeah. So we, we'll, we'll explain the diagram later. You saw those lines? Those lines indicate that whatever number you are, you tend in your, when you're not healthy, mm -hmm. to take on the unhealthy aspects of another number. That's right. And you tend, when you're healthy, to take on the healthy aspects, the strengths of another number. So it's not static. So myself as a five, when I'm unhealthy, I tend to become the worst version of a seven, which is lots of doing and not a lot of guidance to it. But when I can be my best self, I can take on the aspects of the eight, who is kind of the natural leader. So as a five, I can take on really good things uh -huh. or I could. So again, I'm not static. It's not saying you're a five, you can't be a peacemaker. No, no, they're just saying that's not my inner motivation, but I can learn to be blessed are the peacemakers, right? And I can learn to make peace as a five. It doesn't mean that's beyond me, right? But I, what I don't need to do is become the five who gets stuck in their own imagination and in their own endless thoughts, right? As they analyze things and, and stop interacting with reality. Okay. So, introduction today. A start, right? Just a start. Hopefully, uh, Wesley and I are hoping that this isn't overwhelming. It just kind of opens up the, the aperture as to what this is all about. We will go week by week a little bit more trying to put some, some meat on the bones, right, kind of thing. Now, what did your te you're taking a class right now. What did your teacher say at the beginning about, like, kind of starting with a clean? Oh, yeah. We're not supposed to talk about our numbers before we heard about the other numbers. So you don't do it either. <laughs> All right, I mean, if you already done it. Yeah. Oh, and can we end with, like, this is a prayer I hope that we can pray every time we're together as we're discussing this. This yeah. is Augustine's prayer. Maybe we can pray this all out loud together. Grant, Lord, that I may know myself, that I may know thee. This is what we're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. And, and so he's it's very similar to another statement he makes where St. Augustine says, I want to know two things, God and the soul. Mm -hmm. The soul is himself, right? I want to know two things. I want to know God and want to know the soul. It goes back to Calvin's quote. You can't 
you can't know God without knowing yourself, and you can't know yourself without knowing God, right? So, yeah, so a beautiful sense of what we're trying to do. We'll pick it up again next week, go a little bit further, not necessarily even recommending you go out and take a test this week if you have it. We can get there slowly, put more meat on, on the kind of the framework and understand where we're going with this and how it can be helpful. So, yeah, I like the fact that Wesley said in the class it was like, st don't, don't, don't jump to all the things you've already heard about the Enneagram. Yeah. Let's try and start with a clean slate. And that's to what Derek was saying. And I saw Chuck nodding his head. There's a lot of information out about the Enneagram. It's kind of become an in thing. And not all of it is really good. Some of it's misusing it, type others, yeah. figure things out. And that's not what it, so if, if you, if you kind of got that impression, try and let, let that go a little bit and try and come to it fresh, especially if you thought, well, I don't want to be pigeonholed. <laughs> this isn't about pigeonholing you, right? Well, can I just say yeah. to that, one of my colleagues didn't know anything about the Enneagram and at work we all did it. And she, when I first introduced it to my leadership team, she was like, that sounds like something from the occult. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Nope. All right. We're planning on um, discussing the Enneagram at the ladies' retreat, uh -huh. which is going to be the first of April, first weekend of April. So, Sounds good. speaker that we had were hoping for is going to speak that day. Awesome. Awesome. That'll I'll be, be there. good too. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to have a fellowship meal. If you can stay for that, I invite you to stay for that. We're dismissed for today. <laughs>